$100 bill. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, we'll just be putting it in the offering plate when we're done with it. Um, would anybody want this $100 bill? Right? If I were to just take it from Martha and then just give it out, anybody would take this $100 bill, right? Uh, because look at it. It looks really nice. It's got a beautiful picture of Benjamin Franklin and uh, a nice blue stripe, right? It looks beautiful. It is really crisp. Uh, it's a pretty new one. I'm not going to sit here and find the date. As a former banker, I should be able to find that real quick, but I forget where it's at. Oh, 2017. 2017, so it's actually eight years old, but it still looks really nice. Now, if I were to ball it up, right? Oh, oh you people. Okay. And then, yeah, is it now worth $98? Right? How much is this worth now? It doesn't look as good as it did. <laughs> it's still worth a hundred dollars, though, right? Uh, and so, okay. Well, we ball it up. And we just throw it on the ground, and look. I don't know where my feet have been, but we just stomp on it a little bit. Would anyone still want this hundred-dollar bill? Yeah, they <laughs> No, I mean, it, and it. How much is it worth? Right? Okay. I'm going to let y'all know. From playing the guitar, I'm a little sweaty. So, we stomp on it. We crumble it up. We wipe a little bit of back sweat on it. Don't worry, Martha. I'll give it back to you. Okay. Now it's a little wet. How much is it worth? Would anyone still want this? Right? What if we ripped it? It's okay. I just work in a minute. How much is this? Is one less, by the way. How much is this worth? It's still worth a hundred bucks. You can't take it if it makes you feel better. Why is this worth a hundred dollars? Well, ultimately, yeah, it does say a hundred on it. That might mean something. Ultimately, this is worth a hundred dollar bill. A uh, hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, this, is <laughs> this is worth a hundred dollars because its creator, uh, in this case, the United States Treasury Department, placed a value on this piece of paper, saying that this piece of paper is worth a hundred dollars. Right? And it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter if it's a little. Uh, crumbled up, a little ripped, broken, none of that matters. Doesn't matter where it's been or what has been on it, right? This is still worth $100 for no other reason than the fact that its creator, the United States Treasury Department, placed that value on this $100 bill and said this piece of paper is worth $100. And of course, the same is absolutely true for us. Here you go, Martha. You can have this back. I told you I'd give it back to you. It's not as pretty as it was, but here's all you get. Here's the thing. I told you I'd give it back. So I gotta give it back. But it still spins the same. That's the point, right? That its value is not lost, does not deteriorate based on what that dollar or what that hundred dollar bill has been through. Right? Our value is wrapped up in our creator, who our creator says we are, and what our creator says that we are worth. Right? And so we, we determine, we like to think that our value is determined by, as the video was saying, our success, our achievements, <clears throat> my job. It's the first question you always ask someone when you meet them, right? Oh, what do you do? Right? As if their value is determined by their occupation. It doesn't matter what you've been through, how broken you are. Right? Next week we have day camp where we're going to be doing ministry to 100 people with disabilities. They have no less value because their body or brain doesn't work quite uh, as, as well as yours might. Right? At least I hope not because as I get older my body no longer works as well as it used to. Right, that my value, that your value is determined not by anything that this world does or says, uh, not by your circumstances 
or your brokenness or your ability. Right? Your value is determined by your creator. Whatever your creator says your value is, that is what your value is. Right? And nothing, nothing can change that. Nothing can take away that value. Right? And that's really the lesson that we're talking about this morning in these chapters. And um, Abermans, I love that you bring guests. We're going to talk about money this morning. Um, we don't do that often. Uh, so, you know, I love that uh, you get to visit and, hey, that church talks about money all the time. Well, we don't, but we are this morning because that's what 1 Corinthians 9 is going to lead us into. And, of course, chapter 9, uh, it's not dealing with a new subject. Remember, as you read your Bible, uh, as the Apostle Paul wrote through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wasn't writing chapter 8, verse 1. Right? Chapter 9, verse 1, right? He, he was just writing, like you would write a letter. Uh, the, the, the chapters and the verses are not inspired. Chapter 9 is just continuing with uh, the discussion of eating and uh, eating food sacrificed to idols uh, that Brian preached on last Sunday in chapter 8. And the idea is this. Uh, subjecting our freedom... For the benefit or the welfare of other people is not something that anyone does naturally. Right? Subjecting my freedom, or in this case in chapter 9 now, he moves uh, a little bit uh, to a different subject. Subjecting my well-being, specifically financially, for the welfare of someone else, it's just not something that, that comes naturally to people. But as a Christian... That who I am and what my worth is, is in Christ. And specifically this morning in the subject of money. And so Paul is going to answer those questions for us this morning. Uh, who am I and what is my worth? As it's wrapped up in Christ. What does that all mean? And so we begin with verses 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles with you, just keep them open to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And in verses 1 and 2, Paul begins with four rhetorical questions, all of which he kind of expects this positive answer uh, to explain who you are, right? He wants you to know who you are. And he becomes increasingly specific as he kind of goes through these questions that Greg read for us this morning. And Paul is saying that, that certainly he enjoys the, the same freedom. The same liberty as any other believer. And, and furthermore, Paul possesses the rights and privileges of an apostle. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be an apostle? Uh, well, in, in Paul's case, the proof, of, the proof of his apostleship is twofold. One is that he had seen the risen Christ. And that was one requirement for an apostle. If you drive by a church and it says that the, their pastor is the apostle B.J. Sanders... Don't go to that church. Uh, they are either crazy or have bad theology. So, uh, Because the, an apostle is someone who has seen the risen Christ in person, visually, right? And, and so Paul has that right uh, as he saw the risen Christ on the road to Damascus uh, when, when he encountered right, the risen, the living God. And, uh, and also, Paul has also founded this church here in Corinth, which is apostolic work. And as Paul goes on here, Paul is making it clear that he knows who he is. He knows his title. He knows his responsibilities and his role right within the church. And not just the church in Corinth, but within the, the capital C, the church, the New Testament church. Paul knows who he is. Right? And even though Paul probably makes more money as a tent maker... Uh, even though that's his occupation, technically, Paul doesn't refer to himself as a tent maker. That's not his identity, right? His identity is Paul the Apostle. And the reality is, as a believer, we should all know who we are in Christ. We, we've talked already in 1 Corinthians about how your identity is wholly and completely wrapped up in Jesus. You are a child of God, a, a saved sinner, a, a royal priesthood, a, a holy ambassador. 
above any title that this, this world tries to label on you. That you are a Christian above all else. And the ministry that you do then on behalf of the kingdom is and ought to be the defining work of your life. And what that means is that when Tony Ramzik steps into heaven, he's not going to be the IT specialist, Tony. He's going to enter into heaven as Tony the evangelist. When uh, Josh Jump walks into heaven, he's not going to be the uh, logistics expert, Josh. Right? He's going to be Josh the elder. Uh, when Joe McGee walks into heaven, Joe's not going to be Joe the attorney. He's going to be Joe that loved the homeless incarnationally. Drew Inskeep isn't going to be uh, the fudge guy, although that would be a great title and maybe a little bit heavenly. But that's not going to be his title. He's going to be the celebrate recovery guy, right? I mean, that it is your role and your responsibility, the work that you're doing in the kingdom, not the work that you're doing here in the world, but the work that you're doing in the, and for the kingdom, that is what is going to define you into eternity. And if you don't know your heavenly identity, Right? If you don't know where you fit into the church and into the kingdom of heaven, uh, then you probably aren't living out your true identity here on earth. There is something missing in your life. And I would encourage you to begin prayerfully exploring what is my role in the kingdom. Right, Not at, at my employer, but what is my role in the kingdom? And how do I live that out here on this earth? Because that truly, the work that you do for Christ, that is uh, what defines you as a person. You are identified in Christ, and your life is defined by the work you do on behalf of the kingdom. And next, Paul continues on, and really for verses 3 through 14, he wants us to think about what you're worth, right? Know what you're worth. <laughs> And so after uh, Paul makes it clear that the job that pays us isn't what defines us, but rather the work we do for the kingdom is what defines us, then what about those who get paid to do ministry? And I love that I get to preach on this because this is super awkward. <coughs> um, but you've got to preach what the text is, right? So Paul is going to spend the next uh, verses 3 through 14 just unpacking this idea of should someone get paid to do ministry? Is that okay? And uh, you have to understand, anytime you uh, study your Bible, by the way, anytime you open the Bible and you begin to study it, uh, I believe that on every page, every verse, God has a point that he is trying to make. And now all the arguments among Christians is because we don't agree on what God's point is sometimes in some verses. Remembering that we usually agree a whole lot more than we disagree with other people, uh, with other Christians. But, you know, there are verses that it's hard to figure out what God's point is. And that's what causes conflict and disputes and, and debates among Christians. But I do believe that in every verse, every phrase, that God has some point that he's trying to get across to us. That he's not just, there's not verses of the Bible that are just for fluff, right? There's no filler verses. Everything has meaning to it. We just need to then try to discern and discover as we study our Bible, what is that meaning? What is God trying to say? And part of studying and trying to understand that is, uh, you know, God's word is eternal. And so whatever he said, it does apply in some way to us today. But we also, I think, would be wise to understand what did God mean when he said it to the original readers. So those who would have, uh, this letter, this letter uh, to the church of Corinth was originally intended for, how would they have understood it? What would they have taken it to mean? And to do that, you have to kind of do a little research and, and, and to understand that in the Gre uh, Greek and, and Roman world, the Greco-Roman world, philosophers were a really big 
deal. And someone who is a philosopher, or a little later, a wandering missionary, would be supported by four primary means. And there are actually branches of philosophy because they disagreed so much on how a philosopher ought to support himself that they wouldn't associate with people that supported themselves in other means, even if their philosophy was pretty identical or agreed about most things. Those four ways that a philosopher would, uh, would uh, support himself was, one, by charging fees. So if I'm going to come talk to your group of friends, I will charge you a flat rate and you will pay that rate for me to come and speak, right? That's one way. Second is by donations or patronage, uh, so that I will go and speak and people will give, you know, a, 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 they will patronage, pay, give patronage according to what they think I'm worth, right? Third would be begging, that a philosopher ought never ask for money, uh, but rather ought to live in poverty and beg. And so I will go out on the street corner and I will speak my grandiose philosophy with a hat laying on the ground next to me and whatever passersby uh, decide to give, that is what I will make to support myself. And the fourth way is to work, to work a secular job or another job and do philosophy uh, in their spare time. And each of these, again, had both uh, proponents and, and detractors who viewed the rival forms as not even worthy of a true philosopher. And so Paul kind of picks up on that cultural reality and asking, how should a minister of the gospel earn a living? Should he charge fees to those who benefit from the ministry? Should he live off the generous patronage or the giving of those to whom they minister? Should a minister of the gospel beg? Go out on the street corner and preach the gospel with a hat laying on the ground on the sidewalk next to him? Or should they work a secular job a regular job in order to support their ministry. And Paul's answer to that is yes, that any of these are fine. So why in most American churches and around the world do pastors pastor full-time and rely primarily on the patronage of the church to support their work and their families? Well, Paul addresses that reality right here, and, and these verses are what kind of mostly support that idea, because then he goes on in these verses and addresses the reality that James, Jesus' brother, uh, as well as Peter, here called Cephas, which is, uh, the Greek is, is Petros, the, the Aramaic word for rock is Cephas. So whenever Paul, whenever you read the word Cephas, that's the Aramaic word for Peter, which is the word rock. Um, so here he's talking about the Apostle Peter. So James, Jesus' brother, who we know is a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Peter, of course, the Apostle Peter, who is first an uh, important uh, leader in the church in Jerusalem, but really over the entire church. Peter was kind of the guy in charge. And um, both of them were married. And both of them fully supported their families by the patronage of the churches that they served. And uh, even when they would travel around, uh, you know, the, uh, it was customary to take their wives with them when they would travel to minister. And the churches that they served would cover the expenses of their wives as well as Peter and James. And Paul mentioned Peter specifically here in particular because as we've already learned from the early chapters of 1 Corinthians, Peter has a strong following here in Corinth. And so the church in Corinth had acknowledged the right that the apostles have to refrain from secular employment, dedicate themselves fully to the gospel, and rely on the, the giving and the, the patronage of the church. Then you have the opposite, though, of people like Paul. And so even as Paul is defending that right, Paul is saying, however, I don't use that, or I don't take that for myself, right? Paul and Barnabas both worked secular jobs as tent makers to uh, support their ministry. So what's better? What Peter and James did by just letting the church pay them so they could fully devote themselves to the gospel, or 
what Paul and Barnabas did in order to not be a burden to the church. And the reality is that the answer here in these verses is that in the freedom that we have in Christ, that we are free to decide uh, as a church, that we have the freedom to decide. This is another amoral issue, that whatever the church decides in order to support the minister and the ministry of the church is fine. The church has that privilege and authority and right to make that decision. And so we get to, you know, kind of starting in verse 7, Paul will give six arguments, though, to support the, the, the point that a minister has a right to receive pay. So we're going to fly through them. His first argument is that it's customary, right? It's common sense. And he uses three illustrations to support the fact that, uh, that a minister, specifically Paul, has a right uh, to accept support from those to whom he ministered. And, and the Lord's servants are certainly not inferior to a soldier or a farmer or a shepherd. And so if they can live off of their work, then a minister of the gospel ought to be able to live off of their work. Second, Paul then argues from the Old Testament in verses 8 and 9 uh, to support his point that a minister can be paid. God made special provisions in the Mosaic Law for the oxen that serve people by threshing their grain. And in doing so, God, according to Paul, God is teaching not about the oxen, but about God's concern for the maintenance of all those who are serving and working for others. Not muzzling an ox, by the way, was probably used in, in Paul's day as a proverbial expression concerning just compensation. Just as we still use it as that kind of expression today, right? Don't muzzle an ox while it's treading grain. And so he, he uses the Old Testament argument. Third, in verse 11, the basic principle of community and reciprocity supports Paul's point. That if we pay someone, if we pay a plumber to come and fix something in our house, fix something material, and we believe that spiritual things are eternal and, and, and more important than material things, which are temporary and passing away, then he's making the point that isn't it more important to support someone who is benefiting you in spiritual matters. He would say kind of essentially the same thing uh, to the Galatian church, uh, saying that those who learn spiritually should financially support their spiritual teacher. Galatians 6.6. 6. Now the one who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with the one who teaches it. So when you want to take that vacation or that cruise, you ought to invite your pastor. I don't know how else to read it. <laughs> and his wife. It's in there. We talked about it. And his wife. Not his kids. Okay. <laughs> if you want to actually support your pastor, leave my kids at home. Hey. <laughs> Just kidding. I love my kids. He goes on in verse 12. His fourth uh, evidence is uh, the precedent of, of the practice of other Christian leaders that supported Paul's point. As a planter of the Corinthian church, Paul had the right to be supported by the Corinthians more than anyone else. Yet he didn't insist on that right. And I think that's really cool. He chose rather to support himself so that his work of establishing the church might not suffer from criticism that he was uh, just serving for the material benefit that would derive from, from his work and his converts. Fifth, in verse 13, uh, the practice of the priesthood in the Old Testament furthers support for Paul's point. Paul appealed to the common Jewish practice that was prevalent also in pagan religions of allowing those who minister in spiritual matters to gain physical support directly from those whom they serve. When you bring that bull as a sacrifice, guess who gets to eat that burnt offering, right? The priest. So it was in a way, it was a way of feeding and supporting the priesthood. And sixth, sixth and finally, in verse 14, Paul appeals to the teaching of Jesus to support his point. Jesus himself taught, according to Paul, that the Lord commanded those who proclaim the gospel to receive their living by the gospel. And when did Jesus do that? Well, two different times that I found. One, when he sent out the twelve disciples 
uh, to go two by two into the neighboring towns. In Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 9, Jesus said, Do not take gold, silver, or copper in your belts. No bag for the journey or an extra tunic or sandals or staff. He's saying don't take anything uh, that you would need to survive. Rather, for the worker deserves his provisions. Right? So he's, he's telling his 12 as they go out, don't take anything that you'll need for survival. Rather, rely on the provisions of those to whom you are serving to, to, to care for you. Right? Because the worker deserves his provisions. And again, when Jesus sends out the 72 followers to do ministry in Luke chapter 10, it says in verse 7, Jesus said, Stay in that same house, eating and drinking what they give you, for the worker deserves his pay. Okay, there's our summary of all these 14 verses. What in the world does that have to do with you here at Torch Community Church this morning? Uh, and again, as much as I don't enjoy this type of sermon, uh, and uh, especially because of the fact that it does almost sound self-serving to preach it, we're going to talk about money and tithing this morning. And the first point, the first application is to give to support the work of the gospel. That you as a Christian, I believe, are commanded to give in order to support the work of the gospel. Now, a few weeks ago... We talked about how wherever you are, whatever job you're working, when Jesus is invited into your work and the gospel is advanced through your work, at your workplace, that you are doing the work of the gospel, right? You are working on holy ground. But the reality for all of us is that chances are you go to work, you will go to work tomorrow. In order to make money to pay your bills and live a certain lifestyle. Right? I mean, that's the reality. Right? As much as we would like to think, I would work and you know keep doing the work of the gospel. Well, if if you were if you were loaded, if you had all the money in the world, you probably would quit your job, right? All of, if you won the lottery, you would quit your job. 99% of us. Because the reality is, primarily, you go to work. Because you have bills to pay, a family to support, and a certain lifestyle that you want to live. I believe, though, as we unpack 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that for any Christian, and by the way, that's fine if that's your primary reason for going to work tomorrow. But that can't be the only reason. At the same time as Christians, we should also work in order to earn a salary so that we can support gospel work here at the church and in other ministries. Right? That you, you ought to be going to work with that mentality of I am here to make money so that I can support the work of the gospel. By the way, would that change your mentality of going to work a little bit? I hope it does. Right? You're not just going to work so that you can pay your bills this month. You should be going to work also as a Christian so that you can raise funds to support the work of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're not doing that, well, we'll get to it. Because <laughs> here's the thing. It's popular to say, and, and you'll hear it, if you watch enough uh you know, TikTok or Instagram reels, you'll, you'll finally hear someone say, did you know? Did you know? When someone starts with that, they don't know what they're saying. <laughs> did you know? The New Testament doesn't tell us to tithe. We're not commanded to tithe in the New Testament. Yeah, that's actually very true. What they leave out, um, well, first understanding tithe, that word is a transliteration of the word that means a tenth. And so, uh, to give a tithe is to give a tenth of what you make, right? The first 10% of the, the harvest, right, goes to God. 
And the, the mentality behind that is to be a constant reminder of the other 90% also belongs to God. He's just entrusting it to you, right? And so that mentality of, of, of it's not mine, it's his. And I don't rely on, uh, I wish I still had that $100 bill. I don't rely on that $100 bill for my survival, right? It's in God we trust for our survival, um, which is on the $100 bill. So anyway, so a tithe in the Old Testament was that idea that you give the first 10%. The New Testament does not command a tithe. It gets, a, it gets rid of that idea. But what the, what the people on TikTok will leave out is what the New Testament does actually command, which is generous giving. Right? The New Testament goes on and commands us multiple times to give generously. And, and it's building on that idea of 10%. Usually, and certainly in the New Testament, examples that we are given assuming a whole lot more than just your required minimum 10%, right? And so the New Testament doesn't talk about the law of Moses as 10%. It says that's what losers do. We give generously, right? And um, here's the problem. Uh, most, uh, I think the average Christian in America gives somewhere around 2 to 3%, according to most like numbers that come out. Uh, so, wow. Then we go the wrong way when we talk about being generous. We're like, I'll be a little less generous than the law of Moses. Um, and, and so why is that? Well, because of the lifestyle that most of us choose to live. In America, total consumer debt increased to $17.1 trillion in 2023. It's a lot of money for... A lot of debt for somewhere around 300 million people to have. Right? And that's up, by the way, from 16.38 trillion in 2022. Almost every single category of debt increased in 2023, with the exception of student loans. At least our young people are getting smart enough to figure out that you don't go into debt to go to college. That never works out well. But anyway, um, it doesn't never work out. I shouldn't use absolutes, only said to do that. Um, <laughs> Which is absolute. Yeah, which is an absolute. <laughs> anyway, to break that down, the average debt of a person, of an adult in America, is $104,215. Oh, it's the average debt of an American. That's not a family, by the way, that's per person. Uh, and. Uh, that, that is across mortgage loans, uh, home equity lines, credit cards, auto loans, uh, student loan debt, and other personal loans and, and debt like that. Now, I believe, personally, um, that a mortgage, a house mortgage, shouldn't necessarily be considered debt as much as an investment. Uh, you're going to, you have to live somewhere, and you're going to have to pay for that. At least when it's a mortgage payment, you're kind of paying yourself as the landlord as you pay the bank interest, right? So um, it's usually a little bit of a better way to go. So, uh, but, but in the end, you're going to have to pay somebody something to live somewhere unless you live in your parents' basement for your entire life. So um, it's fine. If you have to do it, got to do it. But so I, 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 if you take those out, uh, here's the one that really bothers me. And that's the total credit card balance of a U.S. household in 2023 was $7,226. That's how much debt an average American household is carrying on their credit card. That's money that you don't have that you're having to borrow at about 15 to 20% interest rate in order to buy things that you probably didn't need. Or to pay for things that you do have to pay for because you wasted your money already on the things that you probably didn't need. And listen, as we talk about money, if you spend more money than you make, then you are not being a good steward with what God is entrusting to you. I think the simplest way to put it, if you spend more money than you make, you are living in disobedience.
How can you ever give generously to support the work of the gospel when you're stressing every month about how you're going to pay your bills? Why are you going to work tomorrow? To make money to pay those bills or to make money to support the work of the gospel? I understand it's both, but hopefully it's both. I think too many Christians forget all about the supporting the work of the gospel part and just run up the bills. Uh, a minister stood one Sunday with an announcement for his congregation. He said, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is we have enough money to pay for a new building program. The bad news is that it's still in your pockets. <laughs> now... I don't know all the plans that God has for Torch Community Church. I do know over these last 12 years, by the way, August uh, represents our 12-year anniversary, our 12th birthday as a church. And it's just amazing to see all that God has done, all the people that God has reached and, and impacted, uh, marriages saved and people coming to Christ. And it's just been awesome. And there's a lot of ministry going on here in our church. And I don't know all the plans that God has, but I do know that we have here in our church amazing ministries that are all, to some extent, hindered by lack of funds. And I firmly believe that we don't, that we don't lack money to support the ministry of the gospel because God is unfaithful. We lack money to support the work of the gospel because us, because we are unfaithful. And Paul is clear here in Corinthians. You give to support the work of the gospel. And so I challenge you with this. What changes or what sacrifices do you need to make in your life so that you can do more for the gospel and so that you can give more? Hopefully helping to remove barriers to the church and advancing the gospel today. Right? Whatever you're giving now, how can you give more? How can you become more generous in your giving? Hot dog and a Coke is buck fifty at Costco. Just saying. <laughs> Number two this morning. Application. You support pastors so that they can pastor, not so they can be professionals. Now let me explain this. All too often, I, I fear, um, the objective of, of this text this morning is lost in concerns over the rights that reflect bald professionalism rather than a concern for the gospel itself. Uh, to put it another way, you don't pay me, or Vanny, or Brian, you don't pay me so that I can be better at running a church or doing the business of the church. You pay us, you pay me, because the church believes that I deserve our patronage as servants of the gospel. I'm just going to uh, get some, some honesty, personal stuff with it. Because why not? I did some personal research, because a lot of you weren't here around 12 years ago. Uh, in 2012 and 2013, when we started the church, I really didn't get uh, paid much of anything uh, from the church. 2012, I didn't get anything at all. 2013, the church was like, eh, we'll pay you a little bit of whatever we you know, bring in with tithes, which when you have like 25 people, it was a couple thousand dollars. And, um, and that was fine. I umpired baseball. I ref basketball. Uh, I worked setting out pool chairs and hanging tennis windscreens over at Five Seasons. Um, in order to support my family in the work of the ministry. In 2014, uh, I received, uh, based on the decision of the church, a salary of $21,462.41. So that was my first full-time salary here at Torch Community Church, $21,000. Um, Ten years and two children later, uh, two children to support later in 2024, uh, I'm going to receive a salary based on the church's decision of $52,500 uh, to support my family. 
Um, they will receive a salary as he's also working at the airport. He's doing the working a secular job to support his ministry because uh, he'll get paid just nineteen thousand. Um, all, all of that, by the way, is before any taxes or insurance or anything is deducted. Um, and so, uh, by the way, both me and Denny have graduate degrees. Um, we have master's degrees in ministry. And hopefully we are doing our jobs with some modicum of professionalism. I'm going to wear flip-flops. You don't pay me enough to wear <laughs> nice shoes. Um, I will wear flip-flops, but I am wearing a button-down shirt. And if you've noticed, if I'm not preaching, if I'm not standing in the pulpit, I'm, not, I'm maybe wearing a collared shirt and shorts. So hopefully we're with some modicum of professionalism. But that patronage is the church's way of saying, this is what the work you are doing on behalf of the church for the gospel is worth to us. And Paul here in this text is saying that it is right for the church to do that. I actually had a uh, sixth grader in our church ask me, do you get paid? I'm like, yes, I do get paid. The church pays me to be the pastor. And they were blown away. They were like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> now, I say that, but I also say that, this, to put that into perspective, uh, on average, in America, people with advanced degrees, like a master's degree, on, on, earn on average $144,300 in the U.S. Only three times more, and way more than any of Overall, this is according to now post-inflation, where we're at today, overall, uh, Americans need an average post-tax income of $68,500 to live comfortably in the U.S. So, a lot of us probably aren't there at that point, but, you know, thanks inflation. But all of that leads us actually to the third application this morning, and I'll be quick. Ministry will never pay what it's worth. And that's okay. Right, when you're doing ministry, it will never pay material materially for the full worth of someone who is willing to give all of themselves for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I'll just tell the story. There was a British parlor maid named Gladys Alder. She grew up among the poor of England. And because of a learning disability, she dropped out of school and became a domestic servant for a well-off British family. Her job demanded long hours, hard work, and low pay. When she was in her late 20s, she was riding a bus reading a newspaper, and there was an article about the need for missionaries in China. From that moment on, Gladys, Gladys's heart was broken for China, and she resolved to go herself. She applied to the board of the China Inland Mission, but they turned her down. Crushed with disappointment, she returned to her small upstairs room, opened her purse, turned it upside down, and two pennies fell out onto her Bible. And she said, God, here's my Bible. Here's my money. Here's me. Use me, God. And from that moment, she started scrimping and saving every penny she earned, and she finally determined she would never save enough to travel to China by ship. But she could scrape together enough for a train ticket across Europe and Asia, a dangerous crossing because of a war blazing on the Manchurian border. The day finally came when a few bewildered friends and family members gathered at London's Liverpool station to see her off. She traveled from England across the Channel, across Europe to Moscow, and arrived uh, across, the Siberian, uh, across Siberia toward China. Bundled in an overcoat and an orange frock, Gladys carried her bedroll, two suitcases, one filled with food, and a bag clanking with pots and pans. Day and night, the train pressed on toward the frigid Siberian wasteland, and finally it stopped in the dead of night in the middle of the wasteland at the war zone. The other passengers, all soldiers, disembarked and headed in the direction of gunfire. Gladys got off and started trudging back, suitcases in hand, the way the train had come, nearly dying before she found the nearest station. By sheer determination, Gladys Allward finally arrived in China and moved in with an older 
single missionary woman. Stop. And they all making fun of me. I'm trying so hard. This older missionary woman, who as it turned out, didn't quite know what to do with Gladys. And to make a long story short, Gladys Allward, parlor maid from England, became one of the most famous missionaries of the 20th century. A woman that has been called the most noted single woman missionary in modern history. A popular biography was made about her into a movie called The End of the Sixth Happiness in 1958. She was featured in an episode of the television show This Is Your Life. She dined with Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. She traveled the world speaking in some of America's greatest churches. But the most notable thing about Gladys was her brokenness, her humility, and her willingness to be available to God. She once said, and I love this, it wasn't, I wasn't God's first choice for what I've done for China. There was somebody else. I don't know who it was that was God's first choice. And I don't know what happened. Perhaps he died. Perhaps he wasn't willing. And God looked down and saw Gladys Allward. How much are you worth for the kingdom? Right? That's someone that knew their value. And it didn't matter what they got paid or how much they made at work. It didn't matter how much money they had in their purse. Two pennies. She knew what she was worth. She knew her value to God. And she lived it out. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise and influential or of noble birth, but God chose the lowly things. It doesn't matter what you've been through, how broken you are, how broken your life is. Your value is not diminished because of who you are in Christ. And what you're willing to do for his kingdom. 